All right, welcome in. This is uh, Coach Mark Gottfried. I'm having – every time I do a show, I just say I have a blast every single time because my guests are so good. And today I am really fired up because I've got a longtime friend, a guy that I admire a lot as a coach, but I admire him uh, even more as a person. And uh, he's just done a phenomenal, phenomenal job at Clemson as their head football coach, Dabo Swinney. Dabo, uh, man, it's great to have you. Great to see you. Great to have you. And uh, – you're always smiling, man. That's what I like about you. <laughs> I know sometimes you don't feel like smiling, but you're always smiling. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, it's good to see you, Mark. Good to, good to be on here with you. And uh, Yeah, just I was thinking about before I came on, man, just seems like yesterday, literally like yesterday, young coach at Alabama and, and you were the head basketball coach and just yep. – you know, playing pick up, playing pick up That's basketball, right. doing some doing some uh, uh, Bible studies yep. uh, together along the way as well, yep. and uh, just uh, good to good to see you. You too, man. Good too. All right, so I'm gonna hop right in here, and here's where I want to start, uh, Dab. I, you know, I know you you went to Alabama as a walk on. A lot of people know that, and uh, but it's a lot of people that listen may not know your real story. So I, I want to kind of give you an opportunity, yeah. but. You know, you came to Alabama uh, as a walk-on player. Gene Stallings was your coach, and you and, you and Coach Stallings, you know, he be, kind of became your mentor, I think, at, at one time or maybe throughout most of your adult life. And uh, you worked your way into a scholarship. But what I really want to start off is is the story, uh, and I really want to hear you say it because I've heard it, but I've really never heard you say it. And just talking about this situation with your mother while you were in college and kind of – kind of what happened and how it all transpired. And uh, cause I think it just says a whole lot about you as a person. And I've always felt that way about yeah. you. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I'm from Pelham, Alabama, um, South of Birmingham, you know, it's pretty still a small town, but really small town when I was growing up there. But you know, my, my, uh, my, my dad was an alcoholic and, and uh, you know, I didn't, I just kind of what what my life was was normal, you know, until I got old enough to realize that, you know, it wasn't wasn't really very normal and ended up my parents split up. And, um, you know, it's just a really tough situation. My parents were married at 18. My dad was an appliance man. My mom cut hair and worked at the mall and just simple people, no education in our family. And I come along. I'm the baby of three boys. And um uh, Thankfully, I was a good student. School kind of came natural to me, and, and I was a good athlete. Played three sports, and I had different dreams. I wanted to go to college, and in particular, I wanted to go to Alabama. And, uh, you know, I, I turned down some scholarship offers because I, once I found out uh, that I, I got what's called a Pell Grant, uh, I didn't know what that was, but I had a counselor tell me about a Pell Grant, and then I, I learned what a student loan was. I was like, well, I'm going to Alabama. <laughs> and so that's what I did. I went to Alabama and I, I really, you know, uh, naivety is a great thing, right? You know, like as a head coach now, I've been a head coach for a long time. I'm glad I didn't know what I know now right. uh, when I was getting going. Right. And and it's the same thing as I was approaching my, my journey in Tuscaloosa. I was just, you know, I went to Alabama when I was 18 and I left when I was 31. And I had no idea. I'd never been anywhere outside of, you know, Alabama. It's the only place I'd ever lived. And and we had just been through a lot, you know, in high school. I ended up uh, my senior year, we, we, you know, got evicted from the little place we were at. Then we moved in with a friend, slept on the floor for you know, five months or so. And then ended up, my mom and I split up and I went and lived with in, in, in a little two-bedroom government subsidized uh, apartment with my grandmother and uh two bedroom one bath and and we we just stayed there and then i i went to school rented an apartment at fountain blue apartments you probably remember that <laughs> i know down him. there i know him. <laughs> not, not in a great not in a great part of town but i was down there in tuscaloosa and i just remember renting that apartment and i was so happy that we had i had moved probably six seven times in about a two-year span and i was so happy to just have a place and uh man i just started my journey you know i just i just started my journey and I wanted to be a doctor. I was a pre-med major for three plus years in, in uh, biology. And my goal was to be a pediatrician because I felt like that was, you know, I could have a, a, I could help my mom and I could make a good living and, you know, doctors make money. And that was kind of my mindset. And, and I, uh, I actually, I tell this story all the time. I really wanted to play basketball. And uh, I was, I was just talking to Robert Ory the other day, matter of fact, but Robert and I were in orientation together. 
All right, 1988. He was Mr. Basketball. We're in orientation. And and I just remember, I'd never seen a human being that tall. And he was like a <laughs> giraffe, just, you know, walking. I mean, it was just, and, and so I, I went and played some ball with all those guys because I really wanted to walk on the basketball team. And well, every time I tell him that story, he's like, oh, I'd have cut you so fast. I'd have cut you, you know. And he probably would have, but that was what I wanted to do. But, you know, and then baseball was probably my most natural sport. But I, I learned, I knew nothing. When I say nothing, I knew nothing about college nothing i'm just figuring it out on my own uh, as i go and uh baseball i learned they didn't get full scholarships uh-huh. and i'm like well i ain't doing that <laughs> and then uh basketball you know i went and played a little pickup and them guys where they got like 15 scholarships and then at that time football had like 95 scholarships and so i was like well that's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna, I, I'm gonna this is my best pass you know surely i can get one of them 95 right, right. i mean that was just how i thought and um so I walked onto the football team and, and um, you know, redshirted the first year, redshirt freshman year, play a little bit. And then um, going into that 90 season, my mom, you know, she was just struggling and she didn't really have a place and she was trying to make ends meet. And uh, I just said, look, just just come live with me. And, mm. you know, mm. I had talked to my roommate. So we had a we had a little two bedroom, one bathroom apartment there at Fountain Blue Um and so she moved in with me and mm. and we we shared the same bed slept mm. in the same bed from my my red shirt sophomore red shirt junior red shirt senior mm. year so my third fourth and fifth year How about and that? she would drive all the way to the galleria and work at the mall i'm sure i know you remember mm-hmm. the galleria mm-hmm. so she'd drive up there and go to work and she, her off days were monday and she kind of became like a team mom and obviously mm. my my career started going i started playing and and um and so she was right there with me for for my last three years and just commuted to Birmingham every day. She'd be up early and she's a tough lady. Yeah. And um yeah. and so then I got married and um my father in law, you know, I was a GA and uh he he, he would give us just enough money to pay for my mom to have an mm-hmm. apartment right there in Tuscaloosa as well. Mm-hmm. And and uh so that's that was that mm-hmm. was kinda you just do what you gotta do. Yeah. And honestly I wouldn't yeah. take anything from it. I remember taking a broomstick and we, you know, you open up the closet and you had a little little spot here and a little spot here. And I put a broomstick across the top where she could kind of hang some clothes. And, you know, it was uh, she's almost 80 now. Mm. So, you know, those are those yeah. are special times. And again, yeah. you know, definitely helped make me and shape me into yeah. who I am today. Well, it says a lot about you, Dabo. And, and I know that's part of your past and history, but it says a lot about who you are. And really, even at that point in time in your life, you know, that you could recognize your willingness and desire to help people. I know it's your mother, but you still, you know, that's still yeah. you did. And uh, so I remember then, Dab, you know, I'm at, uh, I get the head coaching job at Alabama. You're an assistant football coach, and uh, you had done really well. You did a great job as a player. You worked your way up as an assistant coach. Coach Stallings was always great to you. Then you're working with Mike DeBose. Um, and I tell people it's interesting. Uh, I was there 11 years as the head coach, and we had five head football coaches in 11 years. Think about that. It started with with Mike DeBose, and it went through Coach Saban. So there was five head football coaches in that short of a time. Think about that for a minute. But, you know, I remember, uh, you know, when your staff, that staff got let go, and, uh, you know, it's happened to us all, and it's no fun, and uh, it's such an uncertain time, you know. You don't really know what's go- what you're going to do, and – and uh, and they brought in uh, Dennis Franchoni, and talk to me a little bit about that because uh, you know I know you yeah. you know you were an Alabama guy you had played there coached there you're from you know just outside of Birmingham you'd have loved to probably stay on that staff potentially yeah. but kind of yeah. give me your thoughts on that. that that whole transition from Mike Dubose and, and Franchoni in that window right when he got hired. Yeah, well, you know, go, you know, Coach Stallings, you know, so he gave me a scholarship, and then I, I had no intentions of ever coaching. I never even thought about coaching. As I said, I was a pre-med major, and and you know, going into my into my th- third year, into my fourth year, I, I switched to the business school and decided I was going to get a hospital administration degree and run 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 the hospital, and uh, and so we won the national championship, as you remember, in '92, yep. my yep. my last year playing. And so that spring was the first time I'd never been a part of a team, you know, my whole life, you know, three sports. And that spring I was working at DCH doing an internship. I was taking my last couple of classes on graduating May and I go out, 
I go out to spring ball just to kind of see my buds, right? You know, we'd won the national championship first time since the 70s. Right. So right. It, it, it wasn't like it is now. Yeah. And I was just out at practice, and Coach Stallings, you know, he's he's basically, he's like, hey, look, you need to get a master's degree. And I'm like, oh, no, Coach, I don't need a master's <laughs> degree. I'm getting married. I got a job lined up. I'm done with school. And he's like, he's like, I said you need a master's degree, and I need a GA. And you start in July. Now, what do you not understand about that? And I'm just like, you know, I remember leaving that day like, who's he think he is? Tell me what I need to do in my life. You know what I mean? So, but next thing I know, I'm like, well, maybe I do need to get a master's degree. So I, I'm like, all right, I'll get my MBA. And so th that's how I got into coaching. I, mm -hmm. I, I started my MBA that summer of 93. And uh, within a week of being a grad assistant coach, I, I knew, I was like, wow, this is, I, this is what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I, and I, I realized I was equipped. And uh, so that's how, I, that's how I got into coaching. And then, I, and then when I finished as a GA, he hired me full time. And then when he retired, Coach Dubos kept me, and next thing you know, uh, you know he gets let go, and you're just kind of, you know, yep. I was hoping. In yep. fact, Ma Mal Moore was the AD, and mm -hmm. and he said, "Hey, I'm gonna try to get mm -hmm. Coach Fran to keep you." And mm -hmm. I met with Fran a couple times, and and I actually stayed around for a couple weeks, yep. but he just, you know, he had his staff, and I, yep. I totally understood yep. that. So next yep. thing I know, I'm packing up, man, and, and I'm on the move, 31, trying to figure life out, and two kids, and. That was a that was a crazy time in my life, but mm -hmm. but it's it really, you know, you know we don't none of us like things that we go through at the time, especially adversity. But it definitely was one of the best things that happened to me, mm -hmm. uh, and and just further preparing me to do what I do today. When I when I talk to people a lot, uh, Dabo, about you, because a lot of people know I'm I, I really you know uh, love you as a person, and you know you've just always been just a good friend, but. You know, a lot of people, especially coaches, you know, we and I coached a long time. I was a head coach for over 20 years, you know, in, in pretty high levels. But a lot of people don't realize sometimes the steps along the way. And so now you are, uh, you know, you're not retained by Coach Fran. He's bringing in his own guys. And uh, here you go. And uh, you go to Birmingham. And uh, I think it was Rich Wingo and Jeff Rousey, maybe. I can't remember, but but one or two of them guys. But <laughs> next thing you know, they offer you a job and I think it's commercial real estate or something like that. Yep. But but you just had yep. to you had to do it. You had to you had to go make some money. Yep. And uh wasn't a lot of choices yep. probably for you at that point in time. I just gotta I gotta put some food on the table and I gotta do it. So what tell me about that. How what was that like for you after having coached and now you're stepping out and you're yeah. going door to door you got a shirt and tie on maybe i don't know yeah. but you're just like whoa this is this was a change i felt like a man without a country <laughs> you know again I, I went you know i'm the first college graduate of my family i got an mba i'm a coach at my alma mater a place i love i mean i'm doing i'm just i'm passionate about it and next thing you know boom life happens and and i'm out of a job and my contract was up in june i was lucky that i had till june and it was just all of a sudden, you know, I, and I had a great resume and all this experience. I couldn't get a job. I mm. tried on, I must have, I must, you know, and there was no, like, you didn't have the internet and social media right. and all that stuff, you know, back then, like you do now uh -huh. in 2000. And, and, um, man, I'm writing letters, sending resumes. I mean, I, I'm trying to stay in coaching and next thing you know, February's here and, you know, in coaching, there's a little yep. window. Yep that you're yep. going to get hired. Yep. And all of a sudden that window's kind of, you know, yep. the job's kind of settled out. And, it, and also back then you didn't have analysts and player development. You didn't have all that. Right. I mean, you had nine coaches and a couple of GAs and that's it. Right. And so jobs are full and I'm sitting at the house and, and uh, Rich Wingo calls me and, and it's, and this is a, this is also part of my testimony. I say this all the time to coaches. Like when I went to Alabama in 88 and 89, he was the strength coach. And I'm just, I mean, I had to, I, I had to, I had to walk on, I had to try out to get into the walk on program, <laughs> you know, and then I had to go through the walk on program, lower gym. As you remember, they put you in jail now if, you, if people did what we had to do in lower gym. And, <laughs> but, but that year and a half, I was with Rich Wingo, you know, left a mark on him. I didn't know that. And so when Stallings comes in in 90, Rich Wingo's gone. And so that's when I became, started playing in 90, 91, 92. And then I became a GA and a coach, and I'm having my career. Fast forward, it's February of 2001, so I hadn't, I hadn't been dealing with Rich Wingo since 
the end of the 89 season, mm. you know, and all of a sudden I get a phone call from this guy and he, he, I remember, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was, you know, that was in the, it was February one. You like had caller ID, right? you know? Yeah. And it's like, my wife's going, it's coach we go. And I'm like, I remember standing up in my chair. I was still scared to death this man. And I'm like, Coach Wingo, how are you doing? And he's like, he's like, Dad, well, what are you doing? I was like, well, I'm just sitting here I'm, and, and I've been trying to get a job. And he goes, hey, I want you to ride up to Birmingham and let me let me talk to you about something. So I and I, I go to Birmingham, I don't even know what he did. But he, after since he had left, gotten out of football in 90, he had risen up and was the president of this shopping center development company called AIG Baker at That's the right. time. That's right. And they were building shopping centers all over the country. Very, very successful uh, company. And uh, AIG was their equity partner. I mean, they were they were booming. But he wants me to come work for him. And I'm like, oh, Rich, I'm a coach, man. I don't know anything about building shopping centers. And I'll never forget this. He told me, he goes, he goes, Dabo, I'm not hiring you because you know anything about shopping centers. He said, I'm going to teach you all that stuff. He goes, I want to hire you because I know who you are. Right. And I know you're going to show up. And I know, you, I know you're going to figure it out. And I know your work ethic and, and, and your character and all these things. But I didn't want to do it, and I'll never, ever forget it. I'm just trying to get out of there and, and head back home and been praying a lot about it. And the last thing he did, he, he sat me down, and he goes, he said, hey, look. He said, what are they paying you at Alabama? Because he knew I was still under contract. And I said, well, I make I make $80,000. And, and uh, you know, which, I mean, the coordinators made like 100 in those right, days. Right. You know, I made – you know, I tell people I didn't get into coaching to make money. I got I, my first salary coaching receivers and tight ends was thirty eight grand at Alabama. But anyway, I make I said I'm making eighty grand, and he goes he goes well I tell you what, how about I pay you eighty grand? He goes, but if you are what I think you are, you'll make more than that in bonuses. And I'm like bonuses? What are you talking about? So I'm gonna get paid to do my job, and uh, so it was kind of a crazy thing. And I remember driving back to Tuscaloosa going. There's no way I'm gonna have to do this. You yeah. know, I've never made any money, and now yeah. all of a sudden, I mean, I I got debt, and and I'm gonna be double dipping through June, yeah. and so I took the job yeah. and I started, and I did that for 18 months, and uh, I tell people all the time it was, it's one of the greatest times of my life, mm -hmm. uh, because it yep. just it just gave me a deeper appreciation yep. of coaching. Mm -hmm. It made me a better coach. I, it's the only thing I had ever done, and and it also gave me peace. There's a lot of coaches that that I think compromise in coaching, because they don't think they can do anything else, you know. And I was very successful doing that. So I knew. I mean, I was just. I mean, I knew. Like I took a big pay cut to go back to coaching, mm -hmm. but I knew that's what I wanted to do. But more importantly, I I knew I was equipped, and I also knew that hey, you know what? If it's not guys, if it doesn't work out. Because a lot of people were telling me, don't take the job. Tommy mm -hmm. Bowden was in trouble, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, no, this is what I'm supposed to do. I don't really know why, but I know I'm, yeah. supposed, to, I'm supposed to do yeah. this. Yeah. And uh, and, I, and I tell people all the time, but when I did that, I knew I could be successful doing something else. Mm. And that really kind of freed me up, mm -hmm. if you will, to just go be a great coach. Yeah, it's interesting, Dabo. You talk about you know, what you made. I was a graduate assistant at UCLA, made $661 a month as my stipend. <laughs> and I was trying to manage it living in Los Angeles. And a lot of people don't realize they see you on the sidelines. Now they don't realize yeah. what happened way back then when you're first starting out and you got yeah. to do every job there. There isn't any job on the staff that they don't force at you at some point and go pick this guy up or do this, or you just got to go right. do it. So uh, you did it. But the, right. the fact that Rich hired you, you know, again, what a great lesson for not only coaches, but, you know, your players. And I'm sure you've communicated that to them, that, you know, how you act yep. every day uh, in that yep. environment, it leaves a mark. And it's either going to leave a really good one yep. or it's going to leave a bad one. And you never know down the road how that may play out in your favor. And with you, Trust. because of your character and how hard you worked, and you know, I'm sure you were a yes sir every day and you did whatever you had to because you're trying to make the recruiting team, the walk-on team, let alone the real team, but – uh, it left a yep. mark on him, and that, that says a lot about you. So so then you get the opportunity. Uh, talk a little bit about, because um, I can remember the story pretty well. You know, you, you get hired at at, uh, at Clemson, and um, a couple, two or three years in, I think maybe more than that, four years in, is uh, I think Tommy was struggling. I think he'd won, I can't remember, it was about six, five, six games in, if I have that right, six games in. Yep. And uh, yep. you're now at Clemson, and uh, – you're six games in and uh, in the season, and 
Coach Bowden decides to resign. Talk a little bit about that yep. day, that morning. Did you see it coming? What was going on? Yep. Like, you know, I, I know as a staff, we all sometimes feel like, boy, we're not, we're not playing so great. And, and uh, you know, maybe they're disappointed, but you're always trying to hang on. I mean, sometimes it, you're not always sitting on the top of the pile. Sometimes you're just trying to That's swing right. your way through it. And you guys probably were in that mode yep. a little bit. And uh, so that, that day had to be a, a, a memorable day. I mean, it had to be a, a crazy day for you, I'm sure, that morning. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it goes back to really the lessons that I learned as a player. So in, in, in my sophomore year in 90, Woody McCorvey, who, who ironically came from Clemson to be the receiver coach at Alabama, I was a scout team guy, and, and I almost left Alabama the, that prior summer. Cause I was just like, man, I knew I could play and I just, I was ready to play. I was going to, I was going to try to go to North Alabama and be the man. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I'll never, but I, but I just, I got my refocused and I'm like, you know what, I'm, I'll be, this, this is what I'm going to, I'm going to graduate from Alabama. It was important to me to graduate from Alabama. That was important to me. And I knew as I would be the first college graduate in my entire family, parents, grandparents, great grandparents, you name it. And, and I just said, you know what, if, it's, if I'm going to be a scout team guy, that's what I'm going to be the rest of my life. And, I mean, I'll be the best one they've ever had here. And and uh, so, you know, came on a Tuesday practice. A couple guys had gotten hurt at the beginning of the year. Next thing I know, this McCorvey, he calls me over, and he says, hey, I'm going to give you a shot. And, I didn't, even, and I didn't even know if he even knew my name. He was, I'm going to give you a shot today. And if you do good, you're playing Saturday. And, I mean, I just should never forget that. And, and, a, and a couple things that I learned from that moment that, that carried on to what you're talking about, is you never know who's watching you. Mm -hmm. You never know. Who's, so whatever it is you're doing, mm -hmm. man, you just I always say, just bloom where you're planted. Just be great at whatever you're doing, man. If you're the scout team guy, do it in a way that people notice. Like do it in a way that makes people smile. Do put your heart into whatever it is you're doing. Like 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 the Bible tells us, right? Like whatever you do, you do it with all your heart, as if you're working for the Lord. And and because when you put your heart into something, you go above and beyond. And so. I didn't know Woody McCorvey was watching me. I had no idea he was even paying attention to anything. I was going, I'm just going about my business. And next thing you know, boom, everything changed. And I played that weekend. And I never went back to scout team. And I led her three years and got a scholarship and graduated. And, and the rest is history. Fast forward to what you're talking about. Same thing. Rich Wingo. Here's a guy I was with for a year and a half. But how I worked as a crawl on trying to get on the team and what, because, you know, he was borderline crazy um, <laughs> and I hope he doesn't see this, but, but, you know, no, he, he, I'm not sure borderline. Knew, I think he was crazy. Yeah, <laughs> he, he knew my heart. And so the next thing I know of, he wants me to come work with him. And, and then Tommy Bowden, this is the other thing. Tommy Bowden was my receiver coach my first year at Alabama. And so, and then he was boom, Curry left, went to Kentucky. That whole staff went with him. And now I'm starting over. Um, but fast forward, you know, all these years later to to uh, you know February of of '03, he he reaches out uh, for me to come and take the Clemson job. But before before that happened, Mark, it's interest crazy. So I mean, just just a crazy situation. So in in December of '02, Mal Moore, dear friend of mine and yours, Mal Moore calls me and says, you know, Franchoni left, right? Mm -hmm. And he said he's hiring a Mike Price. I didn't even know who Mike Price was. And he said, he, he said, look, he said, Dabo, he's going to have a job for you. He said, can you, he's coming in to do the press conference. Can you be here tomorrow? I'm like, heck yeah. And I, so I'm so excited. This is December of 02. <clears throat> and I, I get in the car and I drive to Tuscaloosa. I go to Mal's office. They have the press conference, name him head coach. He comes in, Mal brings him to me, meets me. We had a great conversation. He wants to know if I can coach the tight ends. I said, you dang straight. I coach tight ends. And he's like, well, good. My one son's going to coach quarterbacks. The other son's going to be the receivers coach. Man, you coach tight ends. I'm going to go coach the Rose Bowl. And when we get back, hey, I'll call you. And, man, we're going to get this thing going. I'm just on cloud nine. I'm going back to Alabama and, and uh, just fired up through Christmas about this time, watching the Rose Bowl. Sure enough, he comes back. Now, this is January of 03. And – couple days i didn't hear from him i called miles everything okay oh yeah he's going to the convention so that friday he calls me and he he had a change of heart he said look mm. i you're young my two sons are really young he goes i'm gonna hire sparky woods i want to hire mm. an older veteran sec guy and i just remember going what i was devastated i was so mad 
And it was also, this is also part of my kind of my testimony and it kind of as, as me maturing as a man and realizing, you know what, Hey, God's got it. And, and so, so I'm mad. And I just, at that moment, I'm like, you know what, it's just not meant to be. And I just quit worrying about it. Like a month later, three or four weeks later, I get a call out of the blue from Tommy Bowden wants to know if I want to get back in coaching. And so I go up and interview, get the job. And I was an assistant for five and a half years. And as you alluded to, come to work, we we lost to Wake Forest yep. on a Thursday night. Oh, it was awful. And mm. we're three and three. Mm. Ironically, we were number nine in the country going into the season. And we got destroyed by Alabama in the opening game. And we played in a little kickoff classic. And they, they, they kicked our butt. And then we, so we, and it kind of put us on a spin and we, we're three and three and they decide that, Hey, a change is going to happen. We had no, no idea, uh, no, no clue. I mean, the game had happened on Thursday, this is Monday. And we had had a staff meeting at 7 AM that morning. In fact, the crazy thing about it, I did the devotion that morning. Uh, we do a little devotion to start each staff meeting. And so we had had a seven o'clock staff meeting. It was now it's about 10 45, 10 30, 10 45. And the ops guy comes, you know, into our, we were in the offensive staff room planning, getting ready to play Georgia Tech. We were, I think we were doing blitz pickup. And he comes in, I'll never forget it. And he says, Hey, Coach Bowden wants to see all of y'all in the staff room. Well, I, I knew right then something was weird because that never happened. Right. And again, we had already been through a whole weekend. We'd already had a staff meeting at seven that morning. And we all get in there and, and he walks in and just says, Hey, look, you know, it's going to be a change. And, and uh, he was very brief and he just said, Hey, I, you know, I, I, my concern, I'm going to be fine. My concern is you guys. And, you know, I'll be talking to y'all all individually, but right now the AD wants to step in. I mean, I, I just remember being, it's almost like having an out of body experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was like numb, like thinking like, Oh my, cause it may, immediately I'm like, man, now I got three kids man, uh, you know, just, I just, it just the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Well, the AD walks in and the AD basically, he, he was not a man of many words either. And he just said, listen, mm -hmm. man, uh, you know, we just felt like this was the best thing right now. And I know it's a tough situation and we got six games left. And, and, uh, he said, but you know, I expect y'all to do your jobs the very best you can. And, and he just said, uh, 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 Dabo, you're now the head coach and you call all the shots and I need to see him off in five minutes. <laughs> just like that. I mean, like, you know, and I, I mean, and I, and I, and I just, I was already like feeling like I was nauseous. And then when that happened, it was like my body, I was like, I literally was having an out of body experience. And then he walks out and everybody's slamming notebooks and throwing pens. And, and then all of a sudden the room got dead quiet. Mm -hmm. And everybody's looking at me, and I don't even know what to say. And I just said, "Look, you know, hey guys, let me go see what he's, you know, let me go see what he wants, and we'll we'll figure it out later." Mm -hmm. And I just got up and left. I went to my office. I got a notebook. I remember calling my wife, and I told her, you know, we just got fired, and she was just like, "Oh my gosh, she's just right. devastated." And I said, "Oh, it gets worse. I'm the interim," and she's <laughs> like, "Oh my god," and I'm like, and so I walked into Terry Don Phillips' office thinking that literally my I was already prepared and, and I had already been through this you know we got fired at Alabama mm -hmm. with Dubos and we, so the last like four or five weeks we were fired and it was miserable yep. you know just yep. you know you know you don't have a job right. I mean, but you're trying to you know you got to do your job yep. and it was just brutal and so that's what in my mind I'm thinking he's gonna say hey you know hope you'll do the best you can maybe try to get the next guy to keep you and uh, that was my mentality walking in. And when I walked in there and sat down with Terry Don Phillips, I mean, it, it changed my life because he basically, you know, he said, he said, look, Dabo, I know it's a tough situation, but Tommy and I talked and we both felt like this was the right thing and felt like you needed to be the interim. And, he, and here's what he said. He goes, but I want you to know something. He goes, first of all, I'm going to hire the best coach. He goes, but – whether you win a game or you don't win a game, I'm going to give you an interview for this job at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And he goes, and then this is what he, he, he says, I've watched you for five and a half years and how you handle yourself, how you were the players in the community, how you teach, how you coach on the field. He goes, he said, Dabo, I think you're what we need here at Clemson. And he goes, and I, I just, he said, I really believe that. He goes, again, I'm going to hire the best guy. He goes, but here's what I want you to do. He said, I won't, I don't want you to be the interim coach. I want you to be the head coach mm -hmm. for the next seven weeks. 
He said, you be the head coach. And when I tell you, I want whatever you think you need to do to fix us, this was the word he used, mm-hmm. I'm going to support you. If you want to fire everybody, you fire everybody. He said, I don't care what, whatever you think you need to do, but for the next seven weeks, I want you to be the head coach. And in the meantime, I'm going to interview and I'm going to hire the best coach. But he said, I really think you're what we need here mm. at Clemson. This is, and so I'm sitting there just blown away. Wow. And, and uh, but, it, but it was also kind of the same message that I got from Woody McCorvey on that football field back mm-hmm. in 1990. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it, it was, it was the same thing and you don't ever know who's been paying attention, right. you know? And so five and a half years, he's like, Hey, I've been watching this and I've been paying stuff you would never even know. And, and so, and that's the first part, but the second part is, you know, you can do a good job, but you have to be prepared as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had always prepared to be a head coach. I didn't know if I'd ever have the opportunity, just like I'd always prepared to go play. I -hmm. knew the offense. I knew Mm -hmm. if I ever got a shot, I'd be ready. And uh, so a lot of times you get an opportunity and people aren't prepared, but I was prepared and it was crazy. I mean, now all of a sudden you go from just one of them. Now you're the leader. And now, you got to make some tough decisions yep. right out of the gate, yep. and it was crazy. It was a it was a crazy, crazy day. Um, but hey, we went four and two, and mm-hmm. you know they gave me the job. And you know, um, so you, I just you know, Dabo, I can I always used to my, tell I'm on my 16th year. How about that? I used to tell our players all the time when I coach. You know, you're always being evaluated, and not only you as players, assistant coaches are being evaluated, yep. the head coach is being evaluated, the AD is being evaluated. The president's being evaluated. <laughs> We're all getting evaluated. So you better understand it every day in every practice and every drill and how you are in the weight room or in the, in the dining hall or wherever it may be. You're always being evaluated. Let me ask you this one, Dabo. This, this is a, uh, you know, you, you're down in, you're in uh, Terry Don's office. You've got to be, your head's got to be swirling like, you know, okay, whew, what, what do I do first? What, what's my, what do I do the first thing here other than call your wife? But other than that, okay, I got and I think you had told me this one time. We were at Amelia Island in the ACC meetings. I think we were yep. in a pool one time maybe, and you had told me that uh, I think you made a couple of tough calls right then. Was it that day? Or was it pretty yeah. good? Like, you know, because yep. one thing people don't really understand, the fans don't really understand. You know, they, they watch your team, and they look out there and see your team run up down the field, and there's the head coach and all these people in these coaching shirts, and they really don't know. You know, nobody really knows, you know, but we know. Coaches know. But, you know, loyalty – uh, amongst your staff, guys that you know as a head coach. And, and I've had to make some hard decisions as head coaches, and they're hard. They're hard because you're dealing with people yeah. and people's lives and yeah. their families. Yeah. But then you're balancing that with what's best for the program. I have to do what's best in my heart, in my gut. So, you know, as you walk back down that hallway, uh, what's going through your mind then? Yeah, it's incredibly lonely, uh, you know, to, to be the leader at times, as you know. And so the first thing when I came out of his, I mean, I, like I said, I went, I walked, I was in sweatpants and a sweatshirt. Mondays were long days. And, and I, when I came out of the office, I went from my mentality going into the office was this is going to be the most miserable seven weeks of my life. All right, maybe the next guy will keep me to holy cow. I got a chance to be the coach here. And so, I, I mean, I went and I, I went and I locked myself in like a little closet. It was a, a closet over in the, at that time, a part of an athletic building. And I had a notepad and man, I'm, I, when I say my mind was going a thousand miles an hour and I just started writing stuff down. I mean, I just like, I mean, it was everything from practice schedules to the meeting, to staff, to, you know, stuff later on in that week. To, I mean, it was just all over the place, stuff that was in my mind. I was just writing down. I didn't want to forget stuff. Mm-hmm. But then I kept coming back to, okay, well, the first thing I got to do when I walk over to that building, mm-hmm. I'm going to have to meet with all these coaches. And I've got to – and I, and so I felt – I said, okay, I'm going to let them all know exactly what the AD told me mm-hmm. because, you know what, they may not want to work for me and, and I probably don't have a good shot to get the job, but the best thing for all of us – it's for us to roll our sleeves up and man, let's go, let's go do it. And so maybe we can get this job and, and a lot of people have an opportunity to stay or it helps us get a job somewhere else. And so, um, but I also knew that, that I was going to have to make a change with our coordinator. And that was a really, really mm-hmm. tough thing because mm-hmm. again, yeah, you go from, right. I mean, I'm sitting in a meeting at 10 30, you know, and I'm, I'm the receiver coach and we're, we're getting ready to go play a game. You know, I'm not, 
you know, it's, it's incredibly hard. And, and especially, you know, we haven't even been a head coach and for 30 minutes. And now I gotta, I've got to let somebody go right. who I've been working with for four years. It, yeah. It's a really, really, really difficult. But I also knew in my gut and in my instincts that, that if I didn't make that decision, we had no chance. Right. I, we didn't have much of a chance. But I knew if I didn't make that change, yeah. we had no chance because right. there was just a lot of negativity. And I just needed to I needed to start to bring people together. And and then I knew I wanted to do I, I was going to have to do it. And um, and so that was really tough. So I met with each coach and I was very transparent. And I said, here's the deal. And uh, you know what? I made the one change and I had to move. And now now. You know, that's a really tough conversation. It's uh, hard. But now you got to move people around. I'm taking a GA from defense and, hey, you're going to help coach the receivers with me. And, hey, this guy, the tight ends, you're going to coach the quarterbacks. And here's how we're going to meet. And, and then it's, you know, you're, you're figuring out how, what your message to the team's going to mm-hmm. be, how we're going to practice. And it's just a lot. But but you said it, man. And, and listen, there's been times, even this year, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I had to make a change this year. And one of the changes I made was a guy who played for me, was a captain mm-hmm. for me. And listen – you talk about incredibly difficult and lonely uh, situation to be in. It's hard. so hard, but hard. but um, Coach Stallings told me one time, you know, I, I was struggling with a decision that I knew I had to make earlier on in my career, and uh, I called him, and, you know, he, he's not a fun guy to call uh, to, you know, he, he he's not a – there's no gray area with Coach Stallings, if you will, and um, – you know, he he's just flat out. I was I was in the process of kind of kind of making my case about what the situation was, and mm-hmm. he, he just cut me off. Like he cut me off, and he goes, "Hey, Dabo, let me tell you something. If you know what you need to do and you don't do it, uh-huh. then somebody else ought to have your job." Mm-hmm. And that was like hit me right in the face, like cold water, mm-hmm. uh, because at the end of the day, you know, you have to do what's right, yep. and sometimes doing what's right uh, hurts other people that you love. Yeah. And, uh, but, but ultimately you have to, you have a job to do. And I, mm-hmm. and as the leader, your job is to mm-hmm. do what's best for the team and the organization. And so, um, those are, those are really d- tough and difficult yeah. and lonely days. And sometimes, you know, damages relationships yeah. and all those things. So many people are affected mm-hmm. uh, by those decisions. And they're hard. And I, I remember you, you, you kind of brought up a thought in my head. I, when I was the graduate assistant at UCLA and Jim Herrick was the head coach, we were at a, going to a shoot around at Cal and I jumped up in the front seat of the bus and uh, I asked him, I said, coach, what's the difference? What's the biggest difference between being an assistant coach and a head coach? And I was 23 years old, you, you know, just like you were, you were GA. And just as easy as he could say it, he looked right at me and just said, lonely. And he was right. <laughs> just lonely. Yeah. You know, when you're an assistant yeah. coach, you got everybody in the room and we can share ideas and we can talk. And even after yeah. a game, we can go huddle yeah. up or a couple of us over there and you might kind of, you know, privately not, you're not uh, being disloyal to the head coach, but you have opinions in that when you're the yeah. head coach, yeah. Yeah. There ain't a whole lot of people to yeah. talk to. It's only you and you're there by yourself right. and it's hard. And then, uh, you know, the, the decisions you got to make, uh, you just got to go with your gut at times and then say, Hey, this is what I think is best. And you, and you, and you pull the trigger yep. and, uh, you were able That's to do right. that. And, you know, dad, but you've had such a, um, you know, your coaching career has been so great. And, you know, uh, a guy that we both know, Joe Kynes, uh, who, who actually had the interim job one time at Alabama. I can't remember which maybe that was, you, you might remember well, but anyway, Joe was a defensive coach and old guy, and I really liked him. I loved to just kind of hang around him, you know, with Joe Kynes. But uh, was that Mike's staff, DuBose, I want to say? Was he on that staff, or was that, no, uh, no, I, was that Mike I Shula? I actually think that he, I think it was either Shula or Fran. When yeah. Fran left, yeah. he may have coached through in the bowl That's game. it. That's what it was. And I remember uh, uh, Joe Kynes telling me, he said, Mark, just don't ever forget. He said, coaching, he said, this is a great profession. But it's a bad business, <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> you know, now right. nowadays, you know, guys are making a lot more money, so the business side's a little bit yeah. better. But you know, it's hard. And yeah. uh, you've had such a great run, uh, like many coaches, Dabo. You've you've kind of spoiled the faithful. You, you've spoiled them, and I'll say it. You don't have to say it, although you did say it this year. But I'll say it out loud. You know, coaches do that at times. You know, I went to NC State and. 
you know, they had finished 10th, 11th, or 12th for three straight years. And the first year, we're in the Sweet 16. And then we're in the tournament. And then the tournament. And then we're in the Sweet 16 in my fourth year. And I spoiled them. You know, now we're thinking, okay, the next step is Final Four. And then we struggle a little bit, you know. And, and the fans, it was difficult. It's hard. And so you've had this yep. amazing run, two national championships, I think uh, six or eight ACC championships. I mean, you just – you know, Dabo, you've had such a uh, remarkable career. And then, you know, this year you kind of hit a point where your teams aren't as good maybe as they had been in the past. And all coaches go through it. I don't care who you are. Uh, it happens. And uh, especially nowadays, I try to tell people, you know, with the, with the uh, legislation, with the NIL and the portal, boy, it's hard to figure out who's going to be on your team uh, next year, you know. And I always just say in basketball, we'd play our last game in basketball – and we'd have about three weeks. It was the most miserable three weeks of the entire year because I'm trying to re-recruit my team. And half of them wanted to transfer anyway. They didn't like me. So they all wanted to leave. But anyway, you're trying to keep them. <laughs> now with the portal, well, you don't know who's going to be on your team, and they don't even have to tell you. They just go right in and, and join in the portal. So talk to me a little bit about this year because is, is yep. the run you've had was so good. It was so good that, you know <laughs> – I'm sitting up there in row 57 on, uh, you know, in, in seat J. I, I can't figure this out. Why, what, what's going on here a little bit? Uh, we used to be going to the yes. CFP. And, and, you know, so talk to me a little bit about that, you know, that just your mentality yeah. through this because, you know, coaches, we all have gone through them. It's, it's not, you know, it's, it's yeah. part of the game. It's just part of it. And it doesn't mean you're a bad coach or you did a bad job coaching. Sometimes the ball just bounces another way. And, you know, so talk to me a little about no that. Question. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. We're all human and we're not robots. But, you know, we, we went 120 years at Clemson. And we won one national championship and we've won two in seven years. Yep. And so uh, with that comes and then on top of that, you know, when I, we got when I and, and I got the job, and then uh, my third year, 2011, we won the league. We won the ACC for the first time in 20 years. How about that? We won 10 games that year for the first time in 20 years. Clemson went 20 years. We we've won it eight times in the past 11 years. Uh, we we went on. We we had 12, 12, 10 plus win seasons in a row. All right, and that's only happened three times in the history of football, and then and then we get it. And, but but with that, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, and, oh, and we oh by the way, we went to six Final Fours. We're the only team ever to go to six Final Fours in a row. Nobody, mm -hmm. Alabama, nobody. Mm -hmm. We're second in playoff wins. Alabama has, I believe, they've got nine playoff wins. We got six. Georgia has five. You know, so we're the second winningest team in the playoffs. Um, and, and we've beaten Alabama in two out of three national championships. And so the, the, when you have that type of success expectations and, yep. and, and people can lose their way and more importantly, lose perspective. And that's something that I've really tried to, to push back on. And honestly, this year, and you know, last year we won 11 games and, 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 and won the league. Um, and you know, people are mad. And I, and so it was a, it's, it's <laughs> something that I really have tried to, talk a lot about because again we you know we went we went t we went 20 years without 10 wins <laughs> you know we've had i think we've had eight 11 win seasons in 12 years uh but so we, you just win 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 and all of a sudden it, you you just become numb to that mm -hmm. and and here's what happens uh all of a sudden the expectations become greater than the appreciation of how hard it is to win and what it takes to win. Mm -hmm. And when you, when, when that happens, when the expectation is greater than the appreciation of, and, and more importantly, the purpose of your program, right. then, then, then you lose perspective. Right. And when you lose perspective and it happens all the time with coaches, when you lose perspective, you lose your joy. Right. And, and when you lose your joy, Man, you compromise, and yeah. and now you're not purpose driven anymore. You're just transactional, and I've never wanted to be that way. I, I've always just you know wanted to, you know, be a purpose driven program, be relationships driven, and that's what we've always done. And listen, the ball does bounce some crazy ways yeah. here and there, just like this year. We yeah. we we're 120th in fumbles. If we're 50th, we'd have been 12 and 0. We <laughs> lost in double overtime, overtime, lost on a pick six. I mean, we just, it was crazy. Our yeah. defense was good enough to win it all this year. Yeah. And, but you know what? Sometimes, man, we've had some it great happens. breaks along the way. Mm -hmm. And do this long enough, mm -hmm. you're going to have some of those things. And so, honestly, this year, 
has, has in a weird way has allowed me to kind of coach and teach in a way that I haven't had in a long time. And it's not that you don't try, you try every year, but when you, when all you do is win, sometimes, you know, it's not registering. Right. right. And, 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 but now there was some real pain this year. Yeah. There was some real pain. I ain't talking about, you know, you know, you lost the game in the, in the orange bowl or you lost the playoff game, or I'm talking about mm-hmm. hey, you're four and four at Clemson. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and so it gave me a chance to really coach and teach, and I'm really proud of how this team responded mm-hmm. and just the foundational things that I saw that I knew were here, but to really see them win the day and to finish eight and four, and we we probably played our best football with actually mm-hmm. our least personnel down the stretch, and and we beat some good teams and going to the Gator Bowl, but it's it's been fun. But even even with this year, mm-hmm. Mark, mm-hmm. we 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 won eight games, okay, for the thirteenth year in a row. All right now, this is what I mean by perspective. We eight games. That's a that's that's the mark. So that's thirteen years in a row of eight plus wins. One hundred and thirty three teams. You know how many teams can say that? Mm-hmm. Clemson, Georgia, and Alabama. Wow, three. How about that? That's it. Mm-hmm. And so, guess what? We win this bowl game, and we get a ninth win. That, that list drops to two: us and Alabama. Mm. So, you know, we're the second winningest team in the country since 2011. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're second in draft picks. We're second in first round picks since I've been a head coach. We've had a lot of success. We've, been, you know, there's three teams that have won two national championships in the last seven years, us, Alabama, and Georgia. But, yeah, I mean, it's not easy. Right. You don't just flip a switch, man. Yeah. You don't just take a pill. It, it takes what it takes. Yeah. And so sometimes injuries, yep. uh, sometimes the ball yep. can bounce funny, yep. all of these things. But yep. at the end of the day – I think yep. you got to keep the proper perspective, mm-hmm. otherwise you lose your way. And uh, so, oh. you know, most of our fans are awesome, but yep. occasionally you have some people that can just lose perspective. They, they and, do. They I do. mean, they do. Forget how hard it is. No, they they do. F- fans do. They just want to come, show up, and tailgate, and go home happy. And that's really about all they care about. And sometimes they don't really know. And but I've always said, you know, Dabo, throughout the years, and. You know, when when you're when a coach has to get his team and you have to bounce back from something really difficult, it's like you guys. You're four and four, and you go from four and four. And Notre Dame, by the way. Right, and and <laughs> four and four, and here comes Notre Dame. That's right, and you're four and four. But from that point, in my view, Dev, this is just my view, and I believe this because I coached for so many years. That is the sign, in my view, of really, really good coaches. Because what happens a lot of times, Dabo, there's teams that are four and four, and they go the other way. Implodes. It goes the other way, yeah. and now you end up, you know, four and eight, or you know, five and seven, because you know there's dissension. Players are barking. They're mad. Their parents are grumpy. The high school coach can't believe it. This guy's mad. This guy's disappointed, and all that seeps into your program. And next thing you know, you're teeter on. You're just trying to hold it together. Where you guys, yeah. I thought, did a remarkable. I mean, I just, you know, I'm just a fan. I'm out here watching football every Saturday. But I, I, I'm saying that's one of the, it might be one of the best coaching jobs you guys have done from that point forward. And maybe through the whole year, but yeah. it might be because at that point, it think, that thing can, it can turn. And then for a lot of, a lot of yeah, programs, got, it does. You got, you got, yeah, you got Sam Hartman, you got Drake May, you got Haynes mm-hmm. King, you got Rattler yeah. in a rival game, yeah. and, and you're sitting there four and four. But I, I basically told the team, I, I came in, I said, here's the deal. You still have a decision to make. It's either half full or it's half empty. That's number one. Things happen in life. It's That's always right. about how you respond. Mm-hmm. And we've got more of an opportunity right now at four and four than we would if we were eight and oh to be able to really use our platform to teach somebody. You know how you pick yourself up, and 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 I, I talk to them all the time about, you know, adversity is everybody. But here's mm-hmm. the difference in successful people and unsuccessful people. Here's the difference in those people that are four and four, and it goes one way, and four and four, and it goes the other way. It either shines you up or it grinds you up. It's mm-hmm. all about what you're made of on the inside. That's right. And man, you saw the heart. It shined us up. It it it, it you know other people. If you're not made of the right stuff, it will grind you up. Yeah. And man, we got an unbelievable foundation. We got great kids, you know, our staff. I mean, I'm really proud of everyone. And again, we had, we had the Notre Dame, we started a true freshman at right guard and a guy that had never started a game in his life at left guard. And and we, we ran the ball all over them dudes, mm-hmm. uh, 250 yards rushing, shut mm-hmm. them down, mm-hmm. you know, and just, and then we go into the North Carolina, Georgia tech, South Carolina, and just the guys just started 
you know, and I think they were freed up yeah. a little bit again. Yeah. Cause sometimes yeah. this world, these kids are living in now, yeah. if you lose a game, mm -hmm. everybody sucks. Fire everybody. the coaches. Yeah. All the players are terrible, all this stuff. And man, it's, it takes, mm -hmm. you have to be able to really block that stuff yeah. out. Yeah. And, and when you're dealing with young people, that's, yeah. that's easier said than done, mm -hmm. especially at a place like Clemson where that you're supposed to be in the playoff. Oh, you went six years in a row. Wow. We're well, supposed to do that every year. Well, if nobody else has done it, it's hard, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, it, it's hard to win yeah, and it's hard. especially to win consistently, yeah, it's hard. but I'm proud of these guys, yeah, man. They battled be. hard. And, man, we're going to have a heck of a time down there at the Gator nah, Bowl. You guys are, tomorrow. You're going to do great. It's going to be fun. Yeah, you are. Real quickly here. I got, I got two things I want to do, but one real quick, and I don't want to talk about this long, but. Right. You know, you've got the NIL and the portal, and it's the it's the hot topic of the day. Everybody's trying to figure it out. Everybody, there's so yep. many rumors about this guy's getting. I saw the other day where somebody said Marvin Harrison, Ohio State might get twenty million. I, I don't know. You know, the tough thing is you don't know what's true and what's not true. Everybody just says something, they put it in social media, but it's got to be so hard to navigate through some of that. You got to embrace it. It's here to stay, but it's got to be really hard because it's not like it was when. Yep. When you started, you know, when you played at Alabama, no, it's a whole different no. animal now. This no. is a, this is a whole different deal. Yeah. Well, we're in a competitive situation that has no rules, right? And and that's not healthy for any 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 endeavor. Right. Uh, the it's, the NIL and the portal are not the problem, right? You know, it, the problem is tampering. Mm -hmm. The problem is everybody's a free agent every year and they have all these marketing and there's yep. all this tampering going on. Mm -hmm. And so there's no order and you're dealing with young people. The right. sad part is these are 17, 18, 19, 20 year old kids. They don't know. They only know what right. they know. That's right. And, and, and as hard. adults, we're setting a lot of these kids up to fail. 98% of them are not going to play in the NFL. And we've gotten away from talking about education and things like that. And and it could all be fixed if they would allow football people to fix it. But mm -hmm. it's 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 out of control. It's, and uh, it's it's just it's just no rules. I mean, I'm blessed because I mean we've been and we're still impacted. You know, everybody everybody's impacted to a certain degree, but you know, it's like if we could put all push our problems in the middle and mm -hmm. and, and God would say, Okay, one, two, three, and we could all see each other's problems. I promise you that Clemson would go, you know what? We'll just keep ours right here. We're fine. <laughs> uh, so everybody's impacted, but I mean, I've been a head coach 16 years. We're, we're, we're very established. A lot of, I don't know how some of these places do it. Uh, because again, there's no order yep. and there it's, isn't. it, it would be like the NFL That's right. with no rules well, and he, no salary cap. Here's what and I it's say. It's not a sustainable thing. Yeah. Here's what I say, Dabo, but professional sports had, no contracts, and every player was a free agent every year. <laughs> yeah. That's what we yeah, have. Crazy. That's what's going on in college yeah, sports. It's, it's, yeah. it's every yeah. player in the NFL, every player in the NBA is a free agent, yeah. and they can change anytime they want and go to another team, and, and yeah. you'd have no idea who's going to be on your team. And, you know, so right. I just think it's a mess, and uh, I, I feel for yeah. guys because uh, I talked to a lot of guys, and it's just a – it's part of the deal today, and I didn't want to get into it too much. But – before we go, Dab, I got yeah. I got something I want to do with you right here. Come right here, big man. Okay, I'm in Newport Beach, California. You're in Clemson, South Carolina. And I've got a guest I want you to say hi to right here. This guy right here. Slide in here, Charlie. This is Charlie McGee. Huh? Right here. Look. And I don't know if he's on the camera or not. Oh, the camera? oh man. We're going to slide you over here just a little bit. Put that on here. Let me help you right here. You got Charlie. <laughs> And uh, this guy right here, this guy right here is a Clemson. <laughs> Look at him. He's ready to go. He's ready to play, Dab. We need to get him in the game. <laughs> How you doing, Coach Trini? <laughs> How you doing, man? Good, Coach. How are you? I am great. What are you doing? I'm just spending my time with my family and friends and being around. So... We we hey, had you're a, the we, man. That's he, who you are. <laughs> he he coach. The man, didn't he? I tell you, he loves you, Davo, and he loves Clemson. And uh Oh, he is the man. Show me muscles. Show me muscles. <laughs> <laughs> hey Coach Sweeney, I do have a good question for you. Uh oh, here we go. Okay. So I know you're talking about the, the transfer portal and all that stuff, but um what is your thoughts on getting players from out of state? Do you think that like more like recruiting coaches to 
have an experience where they had to see the players and get in the interviews and like what you said before. Um, like, do you think the players have the right to talk to the recruiting coaches before they like go to Clemson and take a look at Clemson? Oh yeah. Yeah. We spend a lot of time, you know, interviewing guys and they're, they're interviewing us too and coming and visiting and we try to sign, we, we as a staff try to identify who we think the best players are. And in this world we're in right now, you, it, it's it, honestly, the, the, the NIL has kind of cleared things up for us. It's made it actually easier to recruit because you know, up front, you don't waste a lot of time in recruiting because the, some guys are just looking for the money and then other guys, you know, they really want a holistic, uh, development, you know, and that's who we, that's, that's who we recruit. So we don't really waste a lot of time in recruiting, uh, but it takes a lot, man. A lot of time, you know, a lot of due diligence, a lot of evaluating, and uh, it doesn't matter where they come from. We have a footprint. We try to kind of recruit uh, the southeast is is our main footprint, but we go wherever. We'll go wherever a guy is that that fits our program, is good enough to win at the highest level, and um, and and is and is interested in us. So uh, we'll we'll definitely go wherever. Dabo, we might make uh, Charlie. We might send him to uh, ESPN. He might end up uh, doing some TV, some commentate on Sports Center here. <laughs> Good question, Charlie. Thank you. It's a great question. Thank you. Well, Dabo, man, I just want to tell you, thank you. Uh, uh, you know, I love you. I'm proud of you. Uh, I'm excited for you, and uh, I just want you to keep it rolling. You just know you you got one guy out here that. It's always rooting for you. And uh, I got in a little trouble hey, one I year. I got a little that. trouble one year, Dabble, because you were playing Alabama National Championship game one time. And <laughs> I tweeted something out about you, and, boy, my phone lit up like a Christmas tree. I had, I had 5,000 people in about three minutes. They roasted me like a yeah. side of fries. Boy, I was in trouble. But uh, I love Alabama, but, you know, I, I've always had a great affinity for you. So thank you for coming on. and. Uh, uh-huh. Go get it done down I appreciate there. Appreciate it, man. Uh, hey, listen, I, let's get let's get them we're in, the, coach. We're the Clemson. Let's get hey, the, Charlie, we're the Clemson tide, man. We're the Clemson tide. <laughs> yes, sir. That's what I tell all my Bama buddies. <laughs> yes, sir. So, hey, they they're not real happy though. They've had to. We haven't had a matchup for a while, so they're having to kind of still, you know, live with that last one. But it was fun in the beginning in '15. That first one, it was all kind of cute and sweet. But then when we won those last couple, it, all of a sudden I, I got to have like witness protection when yeah, I go man, back to Alabama man, now. I gotta me have, and you both. Got to have some security. <laughs> you <laughs> and I both. All right, Davo. Well, man, have a great one. I'll be pulling for you. I'll be all rooting right, for man. you. I've been rooting for and, you guys uh, too. And let's beat Kentucky. Beat the Wildcats. Right. Beat them. Got him right let's here. Let's do it. Charlie, I'll Charlie see you, McGee. Man. Good to see you, Coach. All right. Thank you. Go Tigers. All right, guys. Thank you, Davo. Hey, Merry Christmas, guys. Merry Christmas. Hey, Mark.